Hello, and welcome to this session. Uh, we're really excited to have you here today. Uh, what we want to provide is really a, a basic foundation understanding of, of Temporal, the technology, uh, and how it's used in, in, with, by developers across lots of you know, leading organizations all over the whole planet. Um, uh, I'm joined today, I, my, my name is Jim Walker, I'm the VP of Product Marketing here at Temporal, and I'm joined today by two of my esteemed colleagues that I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So Max, let's start with you. I'm Maxime, I'm a co-founder of Temporal Project, and uh, now I'm a CEO in, uh, uh, of the company. That's right, my, my ultimate boss, that's right. Uh, and Ryland? Uh, I'm Ryland Goldstein, I'm the head of product here at Temporal, and I'm an early employee of the company. Yeah, I mean, how long have you been at Temporal, Ryland? Uh, like three and a half years. A lifetime. A lifetime. A lifetime. Uh, Temporal terms for sure. So between the two of you, I think we have more knowledge than almost on the planet around Temporal. Uh, well, there's a, there's a couple other people that have a lot of really great knowledge. Um, what we'd like to do is just run through uh, a couple, just a baseline understanding of kind of where it fits. We'll talk a little bit about the history of the project and how, how Max started and, and, and doing all this work and then a little bit about some customers. Um, so just to get started, um, you know, as, as application architects and as developers, you know, we, we draw pictures. Uh, and often these pictures are very, very generic. On this slide, you'll see a, you know, a very generic understanding of a, of a system. This is just a simple order flow diagram. Um, and what happens is, is we design the system and then ultimately, you know, developers and, and operators and architects have to go out and implement these things. Uh, we'll take this, we'll cut it down into, you know, microservices, we'll use queues, we'll use timers and databases. Uh, what ultimately getting, gets delivered in production is fairly complex. Um, and it may seem simple, uh, at, at, you know, at its, at its surface layer, but ultimately inside what we're building, uh, the complexities really start to compound. And honestly, as you add more features, they get exponentially more complex, right? And so while these, these new architectures, these modern architectures kind of promise efficiency and ease and kind of, you know, a, a simple way forward to, to implement these applications, um, they often present a lot of different problems. Um, because what can go wrong will. A database can fail. A service can go down. I mean, I've spent years in the Kubernetes space, you know, pods coming up and down all the time. Uh, queues can back up. Uh, and, and ultimately, like, you know, APIs time out all the time. Uh, and, and how do you deal with these things as a developer? I think in a, in a pure state where none of these things go wrong, things are pretty simple to deal with. Uh, but when things go wrong, uh, you know, we're set dealing with rollback or, or retry policies and these sort of things. And I think you know, people struggle with this sort of stuff and ultimately it detracts away from doing what we really want to do, which is basically deliver the business logic that we've been, we've been asked to deliver. And, and really ultimately, even when things go right, we still have problems in these, in these complex architectures. How do you share state across various different things? And I, maybe not everybody thinks about it as state, but uh, where, where am I and do I have insight into this overall process for each person that's being executed across this, you know, this, this, this complex flow? Um, you know, can I do, uh, can I, can I perform transactions to a single database across multiple different, multiple different services? Maybe you want to do that. Um, you know, how do you, how do you implement long running timers? How do you wait a month for something to happen? Let alone a month, maybe even three hours for that matter, or even 10 minutes, even a minute. Um, are we just putting pauses in code? You can't really, you know, pause, pause code. For, so these things get, get, get really complex even when everything is, is working well. And, and, you know, I think ultimately, uh, and we kind of said this earlier, you know, as you add more features, as you add complexity to the application, as the architecture expands, um, it gets even more difficult and even more complex. Um, you know, if you think about retries and rollbacks across three services, well, what happens when it's 15 or 20 or 30? Uh, the complexity just really compounds. And then um, as you scale and you get more customers, you know, reliability uh, can suffer as well because there's just more components that can go down. And so ultimately, you know, I think developers are, are left dealing with this. Like they, they get caught holding the bag, right? Because they're the ones who have to develop all this stuff and they, they lose productivity. Um, it gets more difficult to deliver features faster. Uh, you know, the, the reliability of our systems, as we mentioned, kind of goes down. And again, I'll come back to this, this really important point. It's really, really difficult to get this kind of end-to-end -end insight across all the process flows that are going on in, in whatever the system is and the application that you're, that you're going. Sure, we, we may have some observability and some tracing across the services, but what's really going inside that service and, and how do we know what's actually happening end-to-end? -end? And so ultimately, you know, I think over the past couple of years, you know, I've seen this happen. I, 
anybody could go to microservices.io and look at some development patterns and how these people are how people are actually doing these things. Development patterns are interesting, and I think it's a, the natural inclination of developers to share and figure out how to how to do this over and over again. And I think some of these patterns, like a dead letter box, uh, you know, like a saga pattern, these sort of things. Uh, they're fantastic, uh, but, but often they'll solve only one part of the problem. Uh, and I think even further complicating the issue is, is we leave it to humans and each developer to implement them in their own way. So they're also prone to, to errors or complexity, uh, and I think, a, as we move on. And I, and I think, you know, ultimately, there is a better way to do this beyond kind of development patterns, beyond just kind of manually coding all these things. And, you know, one of the reasons I joined Temporal was exactly this. Uh, I think this is a problem that I think I was aware of when I was a developer, but I never knew there was going to be a way to actually figure this. In fact, I think I, I stopped being a developer because I hated doing all this kind of chaos, the, the stuff that I didn't want to do. I wanted to focus on business logic. And when I think about Temporal, I, I think about it as, you know, a developer is, is now able to kind of, you know, build for kind of the, the single positive state that they want. What is, the, what is the, the way I want people to actually flow through my application and not worry about the retries, the rollbacks, uh, you know, the, 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 the queues, the timers? Uh, and, and Temporal really abstracts away all of that. Um, we allow developers to code in whatever language, well, not whatever language, but we have SDKs across you know, Go, PHP, TypeScript, Java, Python. Guys, correct me if I miss one in the end there, but. Um, uh, .NET. Uh, .NET. That's I knew it, Max. I knew Coming it. soon. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, we allow you to code in your language. Uh, you know, define this workflow, which is this end-to-end -end kind of positive state that you want in your language, and then instrument your code using an SDK to to interact with with Temporal. So, it is really about abstracting away this complexity, so you can focus really on what matters, and it has a fundamental impact, um, really, on the way that we think about applications. I, I like to think of it as almost a paradigm shift, uh, because I think. Uh, you know, the developers I know that have used Temporal, it's like kind of once they see it, they can't unsee it. Uh, it is really a, a different way of thinking about your application. I think it's an incredibly interesting way to, to approach software development. So, um, but I'm joined by, you know, that's my, own, my, that's my understanding of it. And I've been at the company and introduced to Temporal about eight months ago. But I'm sitting with the person who actually created the project. And Max, this is not the fist, like your first incarnation of this approach, is it, right? I mean, there's a history here of you doing this for quite some time, right? Uh, yes. Uh, it, it took us probably 15 years to get where we are. It's a long time. So where did it start? Like, I mean, how, how long ago, and I, I, how long ago was 15 years, as you told me, but where did it start for you? Uh, I started probably, okay, I, I joined Amazon in 2002. And back then, Amazon was, I think, one of the first companies which uh, decided to kind of break their uh, big monolith into smaller pieces, which they called services. And now we call them microservices, but right. back then it was all services. And the reason they did it, uh, not because of uh, some uh, kind of abstract desires or architectural principles, uh, it just was uh, taking uh, 45 minutes just to re uh, relink the binary of uh, Amazon website back then. So imagine the developer experience. Um, and, uh, and I think clean build of that uh, binary was 18 hours. Wow. So uh, the reasonable solution was to break it into the pieces. And then these pieces had to talk to each other. And I was part of the infra team, which was responsible for pops up, kind of all the messaging between those microservices on the back end. And at the end, I was tech lead for the service, kind of the storage for queues. And uh, later, it was adopted, actually, as the uh, simple queue service. AWS SQS uses that as a backend. Uh, as a, somebody who was responsible for practically talking to every team which was adopting our technology, I ended up, ended up um, kind of getting exposure to a lot of use cases. And it became pretty clear that queues are actually not a good way to link services together if you have complex transactions. And Amazon fulfillment flow is non-trivial. Even back then it was non-trivial, I cannot imagine what it is right now. And so we actually uh, kind of started to think how to solve that and um, orchestration became pretty clear answer to that. And uh, Amazon had uh, two kind of multiple iterations on that. And uh, so practically, which resulted as a Amazon Simple Workflow Service, which is uh, still public AWS service. But we had two internal versions of that before. 
And then, uh, yeah, later, uh, co-founder of uh, Temporal Samar, who worked with me on a simple workflow, went to Microsoft. And uh, long story short, uh, Microsoft has uh, Azure Drupal functions, which are based on the same idea. And later, we came to Uber and um, started, uh, pro uh, like one of the projects we started was Cadence, which uh, uh, grew from like zero to 100 use cases within three years. Yeah. And it was open source from the beginning and uh, started to get popular like adoption outside of uh, Uber and uh, we started a company uh, three and a half years ago. And um, we, we created a Temporal, which was kind of continuation of a uh, fork of Cadence and uh, we added a lot of new features. And now we have uh, Temporal. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I lost track there. How many different, there was what? There was one, five different incarnations of? Uh, we were, there were some others in between. And also it's not only about backend service, it was about client side experience. Yeah. And we, uh, I built at least probably four different frameworks yeah. uh, for client side. And first ones were kind of uh, more traditional ones. Like, uh, which was uh, kind of, oh, you create this DSL and you kind of have objects instantiating them, this like Dago, like uh, syntax tree of uh, things. Mm -hmm. You have a sequence, you have like split join, you have kind of all, it's just standard thing, but are like million incarnations of those. Yeah. And it worked. Uh, but I quickly realized it was not a very good developer experience yeah. because uh, it just uh, much, much harder to understand and troubleshoot and yeah. so on. So we kind of ended up, uh, uh, we implemented this, what we call AWS Flow Framework, which was the first idea uh, kind of similar to what Temporal does. So you just specify your logic and code directly without any intermediate representation. And it, it didn't, we didn't nail the developer experience. Probably not many people know about simple workflow. But later, uh, at uh, Microsoft, Samar did, I think, an uh, awesome job with uh, .NET Async framework, uh, like Await Async. And at Uber, we did Go SDK, which yeah. was actually synchronous. And I think we kind of nailed the developer experience uh, yeah. while doing that. Well, it's interesting. I think it's the kind of the core principles that went into step functions as well. And I think there's this, I, you know, it's it, by my experience thus far as I talk to, you know, people, users of this and, I think there's been more than just the five or six that you and Samara have done. I think everybody's tried to solve this problem in some form or fashion. I think, you know, once you see what the problem is, it's like, oh gosh, how do I, how do I deal with this? You know, I think what y'all did at Uber was, was amazing and, you know, creating the Cadence project then open source, MIT license, and then starting a company. What makes it right this time? Um, you know, the, the, this, this incarnation of Temporal, by the way, I'm a absolute believer as well, right? So what, why is it right this time around? Can I try to answer it for you first? That'd be great. <laughs> it, it, it's right this time because it wasn't right all the other times. Interesting, like the, that's a good one. I, I like that. One most constant message that I've heard from him is that like, when people are asking, you know, like, why should we just assume you know all this stuff and you made all these right decisions? He's like, well, I didn't initially. That's like, right. The first time I, I made the wrong decision. And now I have this long list of decisions that I should make correctly the next time I have to make them. Yeah. So that's at least what it seems like for me. Yeah, I think uh, the idea is that it, it's not like we dreamed this overnight. It was That's just right. a lot of iterations and a lot of uh, different mistakes. And uh, certain things we, took us f up to five or six years just to come up with the right abstraction. Yeah. And I think just as a project why I think we've got it right is that uh, first we've got developer experience, I think correctly, and it was a big deal. At the same time, we build uh, a lot of projects like that. They focus on developer experience and forget about the back end. Right. But because uh, we built Simple Workflow Service before as AWS service, so we built this as open source project as a highly scalable, practically cloud-based uh, architecture from the beginning. And uh, it was practically, so far we couldn't find the uh, point when it breaks. Yeah. Uh, it can saturate almost any storage, practically any storage. We, 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 we run it with 300 Cassandra clusters. We have our custom storage, which is even, even more uh, performant. And we always say able to saturate any database to 100%. And uh, then, and the uh, third thing was because we built it at Uber uh, as an open source project. And uh, initially we didn't get like huge adoption, but we were running hundreds of use cases, high throughput use cases at Uber. Uh, so practically we kind of nailed the uh, operational uh, excellent. Yeah. Because we had to run it for mission critical use cases. And so it means that we kind of got developer experience, we got it as open source, and we run it at scale uh, at the large company. And then uh, we've, uh, we've got adoption from external companies, which was amazing because like one of the first users were companies like Coinbase, Airbnb, Box, uh, like uh, DoorDash. And uh, these, com these companies, uh, HashiCorp, 
And uh, these are not like companies which would take uh, these things lightly, but they trusted us uh, because, uh, again, because all of these reasons. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, and I, you know, I, I concur on the, the developer experience for this is just fantastic. You know, being able to do this across multiple different languages, you know, polygot applications that we have, it, it, it's right. And I think if you're going to change the model, you kind of have to do it across all. You couldn't do this in a single language. You know what I mean? And I think the the operational kind of getting it to it to a point where it's great. Um, this is all amazing. Uh, do you want to show us the technology, Max? I mean, uh, you want to give a quick demo? Okay, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. I, I've been in very few companies where I just asked the CEO to do a demo, uh, but that's our best demo person right there because he built it. Uh, so first we run the temporal service. Uh, which kind of backend, and usually it's a large-scale distributed system, but you can run it as a single binary with uh, in-memory database for development purposes. How could someone get that binary if they wanted it? Yeah, you just do, do brew, brew install temporal, and if you're on Mac. And, uh, if you're not on Mac, there's a release on the GitHub, and you can curl it and install it like a normal Linux package. So I want to demo a very simple uh, money transfer uh, use case. So practically, we have two operations. We want to withdraw, and we want to deposit money back. And uh, if you want to write that, like, the business logic of that is just two lines of code, right? So we call withdraw, and we call deposit. Uh, obviously, nobody writes code like this uh, in normal life, like at least in production. Because obviously, if uh, something fails in the middle here, uh, your process crashes and you lose money, uh, which is actually not a good idea probably if you're a bank. Uh, so the interesting thing that you actually can write like production code like this with Temporal. So the whole idea is that uh, Temporal guarantees completion of this code. We, we call it durable execution uh, or workflow kind of interchangeably um, just for kind of legacy reasons. But any workflow code uh, is guaranteed to complete and keep running in presence of any failure. So it means that, for example, if a failure happens, a process crashes uh, after line 35 here, that uh, Temporal will automatically move uh, this uh, state of this particular money transfer to a different machine and recover that and it will keep running. So as an engineer, you don't even notice, uh, in, like uh, as a programmer, that uh, there was a failure. So it's very powerful because uh, you practically do need a uh, huge class of issues that disappears. You don't even need to think about process crashes. Other thing, if you call withdraw service and this service is not reliable, uh, Temporal will automatically retry that uh, as long as necessary. So there is no limitation of duration of retries unless you specify it explicitly in the configuration options. And all these retries are fully configurable. It's exponential retries and so on. Uh, and there are a lot of features uh, like rate limiting, flow control, and so on, which I don't have time to spend on. So uh, if you want to do this money transfer, uh, how would you initiate that? So this is actually workflow code, and it implements an interface, in this case, transfer interface. You see, I am demo in Java. Uh, as we said, we have uh, SDKs in a bunch of other languages. But for Java, you would annotate uh, workflow is with workflow interface and main workflow method with workflow method. Otherwise, it's just normal Java code. So did we implement this in a way that was meant to be very adhering to temporal, or did we try to marry this to the actual idiomatic way that like, a Java developer would implement something in a framework themselves? No, this is just normal Java, right? There's nothing magical about it. You can use all the Java constructs. So for example, if you want to say, OK, what do happens if uh, withdrawal succeeds and deposit fails? And uh, in demo, I didn't do that, but then you will just use normal uh, 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 exception handling from Java, right? And you would run compensation here, like let's say putting money back on the original account. Or you can implement Saga, full Saga pattern here if you want to. So, uh, but this is like just normal Java code. If you want to have a loop, if you want to have if, if like it just, you can use all object grant design, you can move it to another method or even class. So just, there is no any limitation what you can do here. There are some, some rules, but like you have the full power of Java when implementing this code. So let's just try to run it. And uh, so uh, uh, the idea is that there is this backend service which I just started before, uh, kind of, we have it running in this window. But, and also, uh, when you uh, start um, the workflow, you actually call into that service. 
Uh, so uh, oh, the only requirement is that uh, temporal service is running when you're starting there. The way you would start it, you'll connect to the service. All this kind of code is just to connect to the service. And then you will uh, just call uh, start on that uh, transfer method, which we just described here. And when it will uh, start is accepted, uh, the, uh, this pro process will exit and uh, tra transfer will continue. So let's request the transfer. It will take some time, mostly because it will try to recompile also. Gradle is not the fastest thing in the world. Uh, OK, we request a transfer. We can see that it printed. Uh, OK, we don't even want, want to see what printed. Imagine it's a distributed system with uh, thousands of processes running. Uh, Temporal provides UI. So we can, uh, th uh, this is again, uh, this local uh, binary which I was running uh, includes UI. You just uh, hit it on the local host. And we can see that there is instance of this workflow running. By the way, this workflow ID is assigned by you, so it's usually a business level uh, identifier, and uh, you can uh, use it, and we guarantee uniqueness. It's fully consistent system, so we guarantee uniqueness of workflows by ID. So uh, things like ID potency and uniqueness, I, it's easily to guarantee. Because you don't want two transfers with the same <laughs> ID going at the same time, right? And do users have any control over that behavior in terms of the ID uh, usage and reusage policy? So you cannot have two workflows open at the same time, the same ID ever. It's guaranteed. But after it closes, you can choose. Do I want to run a workflow again with the same ID, or do I want to run it only if it failed, or never run it? So you can say, never allow running again if it completed or failed, for example. So uh, here we will see that workflow, we have some workflow with this ID, which we started. And we, we can see input arguments of that. So these are arguments I passed uh, uh, as a parameters. Uh, there is no result because it's not completed yet. And uh, it will say there is no worker running. Why? Because in Temporal, uh, Temporal doesn't run your code, even workflow code. It uh, sits in an external process. And you deploy this process any way you want. It's just part of your service. It's like the way you would, for example, uh, have uh, your process talks to a database. And this is your process talks to Temporal backend. And uh, workflow code is not running. That's why this workflow is not making progress. It's more like queued up in the system. Uh, so let's uh, run the worker. So I have kind of, uh, and also in Temporal, we have a separation between workflows and activities. So workflow would be the uh, code which is, uh, as I said, uh, durable execution, is fault tolerant, survives failures. And activity is just code which talks to external services and it can fail any time and we just usually retry it. The workflow code is doing the orchestrating, um, whereas the activities are the tasks. Yes, it's a workflow, it's orchestrator, right? It orchestrates, uh, orchestrates those. So we, we started to run a worker, so we can refresh. And also just wanted to clarify, it makes it sound like what you're saying is that temporal server itself is never running your actual code. This is always taking place on the worker and uh, just events are transparently communicated back and forth on your back. Yes, it's a, it's a uh, temporal service is more like middleware, right? It's kind of, it's kind of encompasses queues and databases and all of that. So uh, from your point of view, run code, your application runs both workflow and activity code and connects to the backend server for state management and queuing and also durable time and so on. So now we see what happened is that we have a deposit pending activity and it means like our withdraw activity probably completed and we see that it's already, uh, it was executed five times and there is a failure going on. So we can go and uh, check on that failure and it happened account implementation line 36 and let's find account implementation line 36. And yes, and there is exception here. I actually put this exception just uh, for the demo purposes. But we can see that this activity has been retried in deposit. So let's fix this. In real life, you would just probably fix bug in your code and also fix the service because maybe uh, there is some other issue with that and redeploy. In this case, we just restart the, uh, where is it? Uh, Account activity worker. Yeah, here it is. Let's just restart this process with a new code, and let's go back to our UI and see what happens. So at this at this point, uh, temporal server has statefully and durably tracked the um, position where my code is executing in the workflow, and essentially it's just trying to execute this activity right now, um, and the activity is obviously failing. Uh, and so what you're trying to do right now is just fix that uh, activity implementation, so the next time it retries, it will, it will complete success. Yeah, and also I, obviously I can also kill the workflow uh, worker, which holds the workflow code, so we can restart that. 
and uh, we will see that it will recover to exactly the same state that it was. So it will just, uh, it will, uh, like, workflow uh, uh, code doesn't even need to know it was restarted, right? Uh, so we were at the workflow visit the line uh, 38, and right now probably it will just com already complete it because uh, it retried the activity. So yeah, workflow is completed, and we can go back and check, okay, we executed this uh, activity uh, first activity withdraw, it was scheduled uh, at this time, these are arguments of this activity, it was started by this uh, process, so uh, you see every, everything which happens where it, uh, what happened. Then we've got activity uh, deposit scheduled, and this activity was uh, executed eight times, it failed seven times, this is stack trace and exception, why it was failing, and then it completed at some time. Right, and uh, mm, then workflow completed. So think about it. I didn't need to restart workflow. I didn't need to do anything. I just fixed my bug, and the system just recovered itself. And uh, here it's just one, but if you have like million of those running at the same time, it's pretty cool that you don't need to do anything. It just code recovers automatically in presence of uh, process crashes and so on. You don't need to do anything. As we saw, that code doesn't uh, contain uh, any. It doesn't need to contain any error logic related to. Uh, intermittent failures or outages. This error logic added here is only happens if you have business level failure, right? For example, deposit is not possible because account doesn't exist. But at the same time, you don't need to handle a situation when process crashed because it just uh, uh, handled automatically. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but for example, we also have unit testing framework. And it means that you can test these workflows even if you have long running, uh, for example, you can absolutely write production code, which is workflow.sleep, and say something like uh, duration of uh, days, right? And uh, sleep like for three days here. And it's a blocking call, so it's okay for the process to, for example, uh, sleep for three days and then continue. And then you can unit test it in milliseconds because we automatically skip time, for example. Okay, uh, so just to review that, uh, you can uh, write a normal code and you have full visibility into this uh, code processing and everything is recorded and you see all input, inputs and arguments and this code recovers automatically uh, after any intermittent and uh, deployment or failure. I think this yeah, uh, would be a very, very short introduction. Yeah, it's a short introduction, but it's very powerful as well, Max. And I think, you know, some of the things it's like, yeah, there's retries, rollbacks, we saw a bunch of stuff. I mean, even timers were in there at, at the end, right? I mean. I think schedules is interesting. Why are people dealing with cron today? Like you use temporal to run things like that. And this was just money movement, right? This was like a bank transfer, which you know, I think is one of those ways in which people use temporal today, you know, high end transactions where like a bank, like you said, like that can't fail, man, it's money, right? Like you, it's, it's gotta work, right? It's gotta be reliable. It's gotta be durable, I think is the word that we like to use around temporal a fair amount. Um, you know, but like this kind of durable transactions is kind of one thing I think People use it for like, say, you know, business processes. I don't know, I, I'll ask you. I know Ryland's one of his favorite use cases is, is more of a business process. You know, people use it for like inventory management or, uh, you know, you just, just understanding things and, and having insight into things. I, I've even seen, you know, the, I think one of the common use cases is like infrastructure deployment. Um, you know, I've seen people end to end, you know, bring software or, you know, bring hardware up, run software, bring the hardware down. Like, it's incredible, like some of the things that people are doing with Temporal. Um, Rylan, you've been on the front edge of a lot of uh, people using Temporal, and you've collected a fair amount of like user stories. What's your favorite user story? Uh, I think it's uh, impossible to probably just choose one. I will say that one thing I want to just make sure I, I don't uh, forget for you know what Max was kind of showing there is that like. Temporal itself almost does a disservice to uh, its own technology by making things look so easy and so Amen. much more simple than they actually are. And so even just something basic like, like implementing you know, retries statefully, uh, that's an immense amount of code. Like any developer who's had to do that knows that's daunting. And like that's just something that's implicit in the demo that you just saw. And so I just wanted to make sure that was, that was highlighted there. Um, in terms of the users, I'll, I'll choose like a couple. Um, I think you know some of them are very exciting because they're products that I use, and the fact that they're a user of ours is just cool in itself. And so, like um, one example in that uh, area is Yum Brands. Uh, they're the company behind you know a lot of major fast food establishments uh, that probably almost everyone has eaten at once or twice in their life. And I'm someone who eats like a hey man tacos, pizza, and chicken. I'm in. 
Exactly, right? And so it's, uh, it's hard not to say that they're you know, an amazing customer just on that basis as someone who spends a lot of money at their establishments. Yeah. Um, so I think you know, the other part I love about that is kind of going back to this idea that things can look very simple or sound very simple, but in reality not be that way. You might think that a process like ordering food or having it delivered isn't, isn't that much stuff, there isn't that much work there, but it's clear from you know, the presentations that uh, people have given, like Matt uh, from Yum Brands, that there's an immense amount of complexity there. You could spend days just talking about the complexity of delivering someone's food that orders at you know, a Taco Bell. And so um, I think that you know, the fact that we took something that's so meaningful to a lot of people's lives and we were able to you know, make it deliverable at such a high scale and with such a great developer experience, that's, that's super exciting for me to see. Um, I think another type of customer that's so, so exciting is one where I'm like a very strong user of their products or you know, I really like the, the brand they've created like Datadog um, who for like a lot of developers is like a really representative company of modern cloud development and lot matter, modern cloud trends. Uh, and so you know, Datadog is unique because they're not just going in on Temporal for one use case. At this point, they are probably one of the most aggressive users of Temporal, um, even beating us out in a lot of ways in terms of how they adopt and use the technology. And so um, you know, it's amazing when you have users that actually are teaching you about your own product on like a regular basis, and you know, not just teaching us, but contributing and you know, helping us uh, deliver things like the uh, Temporal CLI experience and all of that. And so. Uh, I think Datadog has been like a wonderful partner, but also like one of the most exemplar users and contributors to, to everything we're doing here at Temporal. Yeah, and the, the taco, I'm sorry, but I got to go back to Young Brands. The taco one is the one that actually sold me on Temporal in the very beginning. It's very simple to understand because I think everybody's gone through that experience. You walk into a store, you go to a kiosk, you hit thing, you order something, you, the funds get held for a second. Your credit card doesn't get charged until you get that product, right? So that happens. It goes to the cloud somewhere, central server. It goes back to the store, a chef picks it up, pushes a button, makes the taco, pushes a button when they're done, puts it on a window, the guy up front grabs it, puts it to the front, they push a button, and then your number comes up and Ryan goes and grabs his taco. And then you get charged. The amount of complexity in that small little, what was that, 10 seconds, is intense. And, and all of the things that can go wrong in that, in that equation are, is, is incredible. You know, and not that's just one time. Do it a million times. Do it a million times, and and like if you think about like the Taco Bell's, like they aren't all in like cities with amazing Wi-Fi. Like a store can be completely offline. And when we talk about durable execution, right? This this ability to kind of withstand pressure or damage and whatever that is, and and your system continues no matter what. It's incredible, and an incredible like use for them because I mean, okay, maybe they're making fifty cents a taco. I, I don't know what it is, but like that's money in the end, right? And so. That's the one use case, by the way, that sold me on Temporal. I think that, that, that talk from our conference last year, our replay conference, was, was really, really just amazing. So um, when I really think about Temporal, I think about kind of like what we can do. That, that, that word durable um, becomes really, really important. And you know, at Temporal, we define this as durable execution because of exactly that. It can withstand pressure. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is a framework that allows you to survive damage of these complex systems that you're building. But ultimately, when we look at that, you know, it really helps you kind of deliver more features faster. Um, I, I, I always like to use the words, it allows you to kind of more elegantly fail. Uh, you know, you might still fail, but it's going to be very elegant. Uh, and you don't have the code for all those kind of situations. And then, you know, maintaining the integrity of your data and having insight end to end to, to all your processes, I think, is just, you know, truly incredible. And, and I, I think... It only fails when you want it to fail. That's right. Because it fails on business problem failures, but not on the infrastructure failures, intermittent failures, deployments, right. and all these other things. That's right. It, it, it's truly amazing. And, and Max, kudos. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to work here because I really think it's changing the way that developers think and, and really changing the way that people kind of approach problems. Uh, I've seen it happen time and time again. I don't know. Rylan, what is the best way to get started with Temporal? So I think some of some of them you saw uh, demoed, you know, even with what Max did. I think you know, starting with our uh, temporal CLI and just having a very good local development experience. Um, I think, like you know, philosophically, uh, I would say go and watch the presentations from you know amazing people like Matt McDowell from Young Brands, uh, and you know uh, Drew Hoskins from Stripe, and um, Jacob from Datadog. These are all people who are really, really amazing at representing the problems that they solved with the technology and how it transformed not just their lives, but all the developers' lives that they work with. And yeah. so that's, at least for me, what kind of has the biggest impact. And kind of gets and, and quite honestly, all it's open source. So you can go and start to use Temporal today. We talked a little bit about Datadog, their Temporal CLI. Um, you know, and, and if you want to deploy on the cloud, we make it real easy for you to run it as a managed service as well. Uh, but, you know, join the conversation. Our, our team is... Uh, 
ever present, including Max in Slack and support and all the various different places. So you can interact with us. Uh, we're more than happy to work with you um, to get you started if you have any questions. But Max, Ryland, thank you for doing this today. I hope you enjoyed it. Did you enjoy this, Max? Absolutely. Awesome. Ryland? Blast. Awesome, buddy. I appreciate it. I like talking to you guys anyway. So. You're right. Um, ah, that's, thanks, buddy. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>